Federico Pistono, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, I've heard that you have different ideas about business in the world and you have been part of some movements that engage with people towards a better society and uh, you have spoken about that at some TEDx conferences around the world you have attended Singularity University you have written a book like uh, about robots stealing our jobs and um, but that's okay but that's okay <laughs> so did a robot ever steal your job uh, or why did you write this book so this book is is an attempt to have people think about our future in a different way um, from what they are not used to uh, because I think society is about to have a dramatic shift uh, just not just in the economy but also in everything that uh, is, is, is about our lives uh, since, the, since every society, every modern society is based on the cycle for labor for income income for consumption, consumption, it just the, the cycle just keeps going on like this. Uh, if you break the cycle at some point, then you have a problem. So for instance, I, I just heard an interview, I don't know, I need to check if, the, if these numbers are correct, but this the interview I just heard, uh, some economists have calculated that there are about 3 billion people who um, are currently looking for a job, and there are only 1.8 billion jobs available. So that gives that leaves 1.2 billion people without a job and who cannot find a job. Now, if all the rest is a good match with the position open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, yeah. uh, population is increasing and jobs, number of jobs are decreasing, and it they will decrease more and more uh, in the future. So what I envision uh, is uh, if business as usual goes on, a horrible future for humanity. Because in the past we've been able to adjust to technological changes because they were they were just slight modifications. Like when in an exponential curve, when you double small numbers, you don't notice that you are taking steps like big steps because you are doubling very small amounts. But when you start to double big numbers, then things get really out of hand, and we are about to experience that kind of shift because we are about just on the knee of the curve. Artificial intelligence and automation are becoming in certain aspects as smart as humans and in certain others even smarter. Now the thing is, technology advances exponentially, but we advance in a linear way, if at all. So I don't think like you or myself is smarter than Aristotle. And Aristotle lived 2300 years ago. But computers, just take any computer 10 years ago, is a thousand times dumber than it, was, than it is now. So in 10 years it will be a thousand times smarter. And some computers are already doing the job of people, like writing articles. Forbes magazine has written thousands of articles in the business, uh, real estate and financial column by algorithms and nobody noticed, because these articles are perfect. Uh, so it's just a matter of time before they start writing articles about uh, I don't know, movie reviews, they start writing about poetry, art, uh, political commentary, uh, books themselves could be written by robots. Already reports, technical reports, entire 300-400 pages technical reports completely written by algorithms. Just last week I've read of this um, computer generated mathematical paper public it was sent to a mathematical journal and they accepted it they accepted the paper and then they replied asking oh could you explain this a little more like this part uh, we don't really understand and the author who was just a programmer who made the program said yeah you don't understand because it makes no sense it was written like by this computer and I don't even know what it says so and they didn't notice so I Computers, robots, and artificial intelligence, all this automation is growing at such a speed that we can ever hope to catch up with. So it's a lost pattern. So, yeah, ain't no use saying, okay, 
put your computers away. Uh, Let's get your... rid of computers. Yeah. Hey, it's, yeah, you can say that someone else won't, and suddenly you are not more, you are not competitive in the market anymore. So even if North America, Europe, Japan, uh, Brazil, if they all agree, let's not advance technology anymore because it's going to get rid of all of our jobs. China is not going to do it. India is not going to do it. Or even you take a small country, given enough time, given the exponential advancement of technology, they will become the most competitive in the market and they will just blow you out of the water. So, jobs are going away, they're not coming back. Uh, we cannot find enough new jobs, uh, regardless of how much time and ingenuity we put into it. Because it's physically impossible. And even if we could, my thesis is, why should we? Why should we fight and resist automation when we can use this and leverage these technologies as an opportunity to finally free ourselves from the slavery of work for income, labor for income and employment for survival? Do you think we should hire robots to work for us so we don't need to work? I as if they could gain more? You know, we still need some margin. I think we should escape from this cycle of meaningless speakers uh, consumption and growth, regardless of the utility of what we produce, and use technology in a smart way. Because technology was not meant for us to increase productivity and growth so that we can work longer hours anywhere, anytime, on any device, and have more stress and work at 2 a.m. and check our Facebook status updates every five minutes. This is not the way technology was meant to be. Technology was meant to make our lives happier, better, and easier. Okay? So how about we find smarter ways to work less, to have 20 hour work week, 10 hour work week? How about we find smarter ways to... And still make a living on that? Or the fact is, he, he, not needing to make a living? He, he, here's the thing, what, what do you mean by ma making a living? Like, if you need $5,000 a month and you earn $4,000, you're poor. If you need a thousand and you make fifteen hundred, you're rich. It's all a matter of, you know, perspective. So if you reduce your dependence on money, you reduce your dependence on work and on multinational corporations and the state and so forth. So if you leverage these technologies which are becoming um, cheaper, faster, better and more democ democ democratized through open source and the exponential expansion of these technologies, you can reduce your dependence on money by growing your own food, by making your own energy, by building your own things and stuff with 3D printers, um, by sharing designs and ideas with other people. And these things couldn't even be conceived 20 years ago and they were not even considered possible 10 years ago. Suddenly now they are become impossible, in five years time they will be considered obvious, right? So uh, it was, uh, who was it? Um, it was not William Gibson, it was uh, Arthur C. Clarke, I think, who said, uh, technology is, works like this, if, if it was invented, you know, between 0 and 15 years of age, of my age, uh, it's, uh, it's old. It's, you know, it's obvious, it's natural, whatever. Everyone has it and everyone wants it. If it's invented when you are between 15 and 30 years of age, it's technology, it's cool and you want it. If it's invented after 30, uh, it's evil and nobody should use it. So, uh, because we are afraid. We are afraid of what we don't understand. We don't consider clothes to be a technology, but it is a technology. And you don't see people running on the streets like, Oh, we shouldn't use clothes. It's a, it's an evil technology. It's bullshit. Uh, like we already are transhumans because I, I have eye surgery. Uh, and before I was wearing glasses, glasses it is a technology. And now I integrated that technology into inside myself, inside my own body. When you wear contact lenses, when you wear a watch. Uh, now these devices that we hold, you know, these iPhones and. Uh, they are in our pocket, but in the future they will be in our ear and then inside our body. So this is getting uh, very, very tricky. And 
it could go really out of hand if it's if if the motive is profit and selling, then these technologies can become really dangerous. So if this is a bad scenario and uh, things are by measure becoming worse in some areas, uh, is it still an opportunity? How to engage in this and make a difference? So like any crisis, it could be the biggest opportunity you ever had. If you exponentially expanding technologies, exponentially increasing technology can create exponentially worse problems and exponentially better solutions and opportunities. So for instance, now we can produce green energy um, cheaply and distributely and these, the, the basis, like the designs are becoming open source. Suddenly you can make things um, yourself or with a small group of people, just with a community of people, um, more cheaply than ever before and you don't need big multinational corporations. And the same goes for food production. Like you don't need to work the land 12 hours a day. Uh, now with hydroponics and permaculture and other technologies, you can just spend an hour a day and reduce your food bill every year by up to $3,000. So this is real stuff. This is stuff that people need. And do you see people doing this? Especially, say, the food part, for example. Uh, I see lots of movements. Um, flowing into this direction, but not enough. It's still fringe, it's still considered the environmentalists and that kind of bullshit. Like, this is not uh, a left-wing or a right-wing or a progressive or a, an environmentalist perspective. This is survival, okay? So, business as usual will have wars over oil, wars over um, helium, wars over water, wars over uh, anything that's scarce. And things are scarce, more scarce than we think they are. Uh, there's, there's, some things are already reached the peak, some resources already reached the peak. Peak oil was about 1972, 1979. Uh, people, some disagree when it was the peak, but it was some time ago, like peak production. We already reached it 30 years ago. Um, Doesn't government and big corporations know about that? Or they cannot address it because the, it's not in their car business or what? Is it? They are unable to address these problems because of structural problems. Like their structure doesn't allow them to think outside the box and to solve these problems. For once, corporations are based on profit, short-term profits usually, like the next quarter or the next two quarters, because they need to get back to their shareholders. That's the, their bottom line. And governments, they have no power. Governments are basically the waitress, the waitress and the waitresses of the corporations because corporations pay for their campaigns, for their political campaigns and they get people elected. And in some countries like the United States, bribes are legalized because corporations can pay hundreds of millions of dollars for political campaigns. This is legalized bribe, bribery. And do you think this is part of the, uh, say, is this an influence, a real impact in the direction you're heading to? This is defining, this has defined the past 50 years of conspicuous consumption and uh, mindless competition and hyper-capitalism in global, uh, uh, globalization. This, this big umbrella name which means anything and nothing. It's, it, it, it has brought um, a lot of wealth to a few people but the trickle down isn't working as it should be. So, but still, if you take, for example, uh, technology people, uh, developers, for example, you can be a poor guy in a poor village, and you can learn free. Uh, you can learn coding free, and you can uh, make some money on that. Then you start seeing, start seeing that the ideas you generate might become nice products, and you start making money on that. And then you see that everybody is celebrating, that entrepreneurs are a way that you can emancipate your life yeah. from the co conditions you were born into. Yeah. So, still it, it doesn't uh, only show signs of scarcity, but also of 
uh, abundance. I mean, oh, yeah, take yeah, this path absolutely. and you might become rich too. Absolutely. And life and might become easier and happier and more engaging. And, absolutely. Uh, um, and part of what you mentioned is actually, uh, I have a benefit corporation that addresses exactly this, to give um, people who have no opportunities in emerging economies um, the ability to become educated and learn new skills and find jobs. So this, this can work. But the problem is that in the long run, in the large scale, this doesn't work. There are just not enough things to do, not enough jobs. And um, yes, you could become an entrepreneur and, or a really good coder or programmer. And, but the problem is not for everyone. It's just, it doesn't work on a global scale. So my point is, instead of increasing your dependence on money by entering this cycle of needing more and more and more every time, you can use your mental skills, your cognitive potential to invest in yourself so that yes, you can learn new skills, yes, you can become an entrepreneur, but not so that you can always earn more money and become a cog into the big system because that only happens at the expenses of someone else. So capitalism is known for not being able to solve its problems. It just moves them around geographically. And this is not a socialist idea. Richard Branson, who's not exactly a well-known socialist, but, um, he just wrote a book called Screw Business as Usual. Uh, and uh, Bill Gates spoke about how f capitalism needs to be fixed because as it is now, it's broken. Uh, and you think this is part of the solution, like depend less on buying? Depend less on money and become more resilient. Because right now we have the technologies to work little and to produce for our needs. So if you take Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is, you know, at the basis you need food, you need shelter, you need water, you need... Uh, sex, you need uh, a house. If those things are not provided, you're not going to think of what's at the top of those. You need to first provide the basic needs and then you can go up into the pyramid of needs. And more and more, these things can be provided by ourselves or our close communities by leveraging these technologies. And this was not even conceivable 10 years ago. So I'm saying instead of fighting automation and fight and like we are fighting this lost battle because it's a race at the bottom like we're doing this kind of micro tasks and uh, this all these things are going to be automated like very soon and even what we consider creative jobs um, are will be automated H&M now uses almost entirely virtual models and so they, have, they don't need photographers and they do not need models they only need a couple of photoshop designers and they do everything on the computer so, well they don't need models but they still need the photoshop guys yeah but you the point is you take away a hundred jobs and you create one that's the kind of difference 99 people out of a job and one works so if you take Kodak they had 145,000 employees in 1984, 90% market share in the US. 2012, they had a net worth of negative $1 billion and they went bankrupt. The same year, Instagram, they had 13 employees, 2012, and they were sold to Facebook for a billion dollars. So on one side you have a company with 145,000 people, on the other you have a company with 13 people. So why... Is this uh, smaller company that is worth more, right? In in the in the in the right direction? I, I don't make judgments of uh, right or wrong. I'm just saying what it is. And what it is is new companies employ very few people, and the value per employee is always larger. Like if you if you take a look at this graph that I made, it's it's pretty self evident assessment. Look, here, Walmart, McDonald's, like Walmart, 2.1 million employees, $200. You see here the, the date in which it was founded. You go down and down and down and you see 
as we get closer to today, we have less employees and more revenue per employee. This is what happens. Facebook, 3,000 employees, each one is valued $1.4 million. This is the reality of today. New companies, uh, they employ very few people and they make a lot of money. So, a colleague of mine, a professor at MIT, uh, Andrew McAfee, made this graph showing corporate profits and corporate investments are going up, 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 but employment to population ratio is going down, down, down. And this is only getting worse and worse and worse. So why are we fighting this? It's nonsense. Like, people say, oh, we can find new jobs. Sure, I can, I can easily envision many futures where everyone has a job. Like, one job could be to go to, go to an office, sit down, and look at the computer and just read emails and answer bullshit for eight hours. Does it sound familiar? Like you're not doing anything, you're just wasting your time, but it's, it looks like you're doing something because, you know, people need the carrot and stick thing. This is 17th century thinking. This is, this is medieval. Like we should, be, we, could, we should be doing better than this. Like this is 2012, come on. Like, can we, can we go and explore the fucking galaxy already? You believe the idea is like, we have to recognize that we are free and less dependent, or we have to break to be less dependent? You, you, need, a, you need a plan. You need a damn plan. You, you need to study um, how to become more self-dependent, which doesn't mean to isolate from the rest of society. It just means to rely on a community of people you trust instead of corporations and government that you don't trust and you shouldn't trust. So you need a plan, you need to study things which are, by the way, free to look up online. You study them, you make a, say, five-year plan and you say, in five years, right now I need $3,000 a month, in five years I only need $1,000. That means that I, I can't quit work, but that means I only have to work a third of the time. So if you work less, then what happens? Suddenly you have more spare time. With spare time, what, what can you do? You can invest on yourself. You can study things you like. You can enjoy more things and maybe you will find some occupation that maybe pays less but is more meaningful for you. I like this idea, uh, but let's say uh, when the year arrives, 1,000 is worth less. And I discover, wow, I need more. So I just work more. Uh, 1,000 is an example. It's 33% of the original, of the principle. So my point is, um, if, if you can start reducing your dependence on certain things, then there is like an avalanche effect, because it's a virtuous cycle. Suddenly you become part, you're involved in a community which helps you, you help them, you have many communities and the more you think about how to become emancipated, the more solutions you find because your mindset is already in that kind of framework. So you will, you will suddenly look for articles and news that go into that direction and you will see, oh there's a new model 3D printer, oh there's this guy who's been doing that project there and suddenly you see a whole new world. Instead of being a passive observer of your life, where things just happen and you are just walking the path that they, they chose for you, which was, you go to school, you learn this, you go to work, have kids, die. Maybe not. Maybe there is something else, right? Yes, that's pretty interesting. Uh, so those who want to see deeper the, the subjects you discuss in this book, which you will describe as not a uh, soap opera, but is this like a technical book or a conceptual book? How would you describe it? So this, uh, this topic is, hasn't been... Is it like philosophy? No, 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 no. This, is, this, is, this is as practical as you can get. Like, if you look at the width of the book, this is solutions. Practical solutions. Show one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can look at. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
So here, for instance, uh, it's a summary of house retrofit savings that you can do with the payback time, the cost, the 10-year savings, the return of investment. Um, yeah, some of the things you can do, like here, LED light bulbs, high efficiency, household appliance, programmable thermostats. Uh, this is just one of the many examples. Like, if you think creatively on how to make your life easier and better through technology, then you can. Uh, it really sounds more defined and smarter, so it has to do with using uh, also a lot of these free tools that are available yeah. more and more. Absolutely. Uh, especially if someone will keep paying their bills so it remains active, right? Yeah. So, I mean, if you... If suddenly you don't use the, the electric grid anymore or you sell to the electric grid as much as you uh, consume, then you are at zero. It's the perfect... Like you're at parity, right? You don't spend anything, you don't earn anything. Uh, you... You're self-sufficient in that regard. With food is a bit more difficult because, you know, uh, it's not easy to grow uh, tuna in your backyard. But you can realistically make 30% of your food pr production, even 40% of your food needs, just in a very small garden in your backyard. Or even in an apartment, you can make up to 5-10% using small hydroponic systems. Um, and, and these technologies, they are becoming better and better. Like, in a few years, you'll have a fridge size container where you just grow hydroponic stuff and it's all automated. Right now, it's very... Like, you can go to Kickstarter, there are people starting projects with uh, these vertical farms, uh, uh, ideas and right now they are like a bit like a toy, you know, a bit like more of a, a hobby. Um, you you wouldn't believe that as a means of survival, but it can reduce up to a certain point your dependence. And these technologies they can become a bit better and better. Um, and as they do, you become more free. That's pretty interesting. Thank you, Federico. Thank you.